moving into the more, again, dramatic connection of AI and humans, we've got a new report as of January 2nd from RAND called Plagues, Cyborgs, and Super Soldiers, the Human Domain of War. RAND is a research group that's connected to not just the United States government and Department of Defense, but other ones across the world as well. So when they come out with stuff, they're the ones that talk about like the Internet of Bodies and stuff. So when they speak, we should probably pay attention because something interesting is happening. So Plague Cyborgs and Super Soldiers, the Human Domain of War. This is a 42-page report. We're not going to go through all 42 pages, just a forewarning, because I don't think any of us want to sit here through that. I had to. Uh, That's what I do for you guys. I love you guys. Um, The 42-page report goes on to talk about bioengineered super soldiers that can withstand the uh, the harshest combat environments, whether it's disease, weather, or injury. It also speaks on telepathic capabilities between men, AI, and machine that allow control of the machines via just their thoughts. We've talked about this in the past already. We're not going to talk about it like the telepathic drone swarms where soldiers are able to control up to three drones. They want to increase it more, but up to three drones just using their minds. So that's that telepathic connection between the man and the machine. That's right. They're working on it. It's there. Um, The report even goes on to comment about Australian researchers, get this, um, determining, or uh, yeah, Australian researchers determining that robots can be steered by brain signals collected and translated by a graphene sensor worn behind the ear of a nearby soldier. Now, because of the platform I'm on, um, I can't comment on certain things but there have been discussions about graphene being in things uh being put in people i'll just say it that way i'm not a doctor i'm not implying anything but you guys understand what i'm saying if you don't know what i what i'm saying look it up because you can find it so keep that in mind that's something to keep in mind The report also states that we already know uh, what we already know in regards to hacking someone's brain as well, because it goes on to warn how if you start attaching these things to the brains of soldiers, they can then be hacked and they can inject fear and ideas and, and anxiety and really start to mess with the brains of people. That's right. You can start hacking brains. Now, I've talked about this in the past a bunch. And I've shown this video. I'm going to show it again. It's been a while. It's just how I think it's something that needs to be seen more often. Because there's a lady by the name of Nita Farahani who has described this hacking of someone's brain where memories and ideas can be injected into the mind of a person. And you can even inject pain via that brain hack as well. I'll just let her explain it are convicted in their belief. Uh, and so, you know, to Jack's point about using some of the, the lie detection technology, particularly for eyewitnesses, mm-hmm. not only can we put information in without blowing up your brain, um, we can put it in and then you can believe it so sincerely uh, at that the problem is you can testify to that effect. And in fact, wow. we've seen this in a number of ways that police were doing lineups um, where the suggestibility of the information was so strong that people would later identify a person that they'd seen. You know, for example, you show a picture lineup and only one person has on a jacket and nobody else does. Um, and then when you go to the live lineup, uh, because your brain triggered that there was something different about that person, you identify the person who you've just seen, uh, but not realizing that it's because of some difference. And then you've seen them twice. And now you're asked to testify as an eyewitness, and you're so convicted um, about having seen that person commit the crime, even though that person's utterly innocent, uh, that it becomes a planted memory. And so there's some really interesting research that we can plant false memories in the brain. Uh, and in a different context, um, one of the emerging areas that's really interesting in law and neuroscience is pain detection. Mm. Um, and once we understand the circuitries that uh, cause pain, I guess the question is, could we then instill pain and use that mm. in many coercive measures uh, in the legal system as well? So. Wow. Nita Farahani, everybody. Noticed how she was all excited 
talking about this, smirking, grinning, happy as can be. Yeah. This is the woman that I've really been warning about uh, for about two years now. Um, again, I know everybody talks about Klaus Schwab. Everybody talks about Yuval Harari. Everybody talks about Bill Gates. Nobody talks about her. And the stuff that she's doing is they talk about it, except, you know, Bill Gates is doing his stuff. But the other guys, they talk about this stuff. It's her that's actually doing it. She is the one that's behind getting this stuff rolling. She is one of the masterminds to getting this stuff done. And she's just gleefully talking about it. Nobody knows who this woman is, but my word, you want to talk about evil. You just stared at the face of somebody smiling about injecting memories, ideas, false ideas in the people's brains, and then causing pain to them. She gets her giggles from that. But this is what the Rand report was talking about, was things like this. Now, just wait until they start just not just super soldiers, but start putting that in people, too. Think about that. Now, where it gets even more sinister, if you could think of it that way, is the altering of the human genome. Now, from here on out, I've got to be very careful of what I say. Um, so I have to censor things or some things that I can't say. You just got to try and follow along with me, people. So things like requiring less sleep, increasing stamina, and improved breath breathing capabilities are discussed. But the mention of a 2021 RAND report of, and this is from that, quote unquote, adding reptilian genes that provide the ability to see in infrared and making humans stronger, more intelligent, or more uh, adapted to extreme environments are all available through geno uh, genomic editing. That is from a 2001 RAND report. I kid you not. What many would scream, conspiracy theorist and science fiction, it's actually something that they are doing. And I would bet, I don't have any way of confirming this. Again, this is disclaimer, Zach, speculation. I would bet they've already got it up and running. When you get to the point where there's so much mixing of human, of genes, and of machines, that question of where does the human end and the machine begin pops up. As we know in scripture, the mixing of iron and clay I don't think any of us could imagine that this is what we, we could imagine, you know, mixing human with machine. But this we're getting into territory that, again, I don't think any of us had the brain power to even comprehend a few years back. And now all of a sudden we're looking at this and it's just, yeah, just everyday conversation. I have a cup of coffee. Let's talk about adding reptilian genes to make us see an infrared. It's just another Tuesday, right? But the question of where does the human end and the machine begin really starts to Happen. And so we start entering into the territory of the singularity. And um, I've, I've shown this quote a bunch of times before, but it really, really does uh, paint a picture. This is Ray Kurzweil. He's a futurist. He's on board with transhumanism and getting all this stuff going. He wants to bring in the singularity. This is back in 2005 when he was asked what it is. And he says, it's a future period during which the pace of technological change will be so rapid, its impact so deep that human life will be irreversibly transformed. Now, if we jump down, it says, the singularity will represent the merger of our biological thinking and existence with our technology, resulting in a world that is still human, but that transcends our biological roots. There will be no distinction post-singularity between human and machine or between physical and virtual reality. That is what they are doing. That is exactly what they are doing. They are trying to enter into the singularity where there is a blurred line between humanity ending and the machine beginning. That's what they're aiming for. That's what they're trying to get to. And this goes back again to the Tower of Babel. Everything that we see that they're trying to accomplish with this beast system is literally trying to get back to the Tower of Babel, get back to Babel. That is what they want to do. And back then it was about 
them believe it. We are gods. Let's build a tower for us up to the heavens in, in this stuff. They're trying to become gods. Now, I've talked about this in the End Times New Age series a bunch. We're not going to get into it tonight, obviously. But Barbara Marks Hubbard and a bunch of other futurists have talked about this has to do with the Christ consciousness and the conscious evolution. This has to do with we are gods. So getting back to the Tower of Babel. And in order to reach the next evolution of humans, we have to bind ourselves with technology into transhumanism in order to reach that next evolution, which is the Christ consciousness. This is exactly what they're trying to do when you're talking about genomic editing, adding in telepathic machinery for humans to interact with AI and do all these things. This is where that comes from. This is what they're trying to accomplish. They're trying to get back to Babel, trying to become gods. And ultimately, that is the mystery religion. Again, we're not going to get into that tonight, um, but we've talked about it a bunch. And this is what they're trying to do. So it's no surprise that they're continuing to advance in this direction. But the report speaks on, and again, I have to censor myself. I'm not a doctor, not claiming anything. Speaks on messenger vitamins and crispy nines. Being on uh, being an important part of protection, but also used as an offensive weapon as well. The question was always making it quicker and easier. What is the fastest, least invasive way, the simplest way in order to broadly distribute a messenger vitamin and crispy nine? What is the best way to do that? Well, coming from the Acoustical Society of America, we're seeing the research of vitamin delivery via ultrasound. Let's take a look. Acoustical Society of America invites media to Sydney meeting. This was in December, so this was a month ago. The scientific conference brings together acousticians, Acousticians, I, I'm not sure. Researchers, uh, people who play, uh, play acoustic things. <laughs> That's what that is. Researchers, musicians, and more ex experts from around the world. Why in, while in Sydney, they will describe their work on various topics, including needle-free, ultrasound-enhanced vitamin delivery. Hmm. The other stuff doesn't really matter. It's about making it so people who can't, like, have hearing can listen to ping pong stuff but that's the most important thing now if we keep going um this is a report that they put out just before the event that explains what's going on here so you can see the picture you got the ultrasound where it's basically digging holes into the skin now investigating needle free ultrasound vitamin delivery ultrasound pulse delivers vac uh, vitamins through the skin without needles this technique which employs sound waves to create bubbles that forge a path for the vitamin may be especially helpful for DNA vitamins. So that's what that picture is describing. But to get a better idea, they explain it a little bit more. So a, doc, a doctoral student at the University of Oxford's uh, Institute for Biomedical Engineering is investigating the potential of a painless needle-free vitamin delivery by ultrasound. He will share the recent uh, announcements or advancements in the promising technique at that event we were just talking about. Now, he says, our method relies on an acoustic effect called cavitation. Uh, if you anybody's plumbers or is a part of a plumbing family, I'm sure you've heard of this before because uh, this is really what it comes from. Um, but effect called cavitation, which is the formation and popping of bubbles in response to a sound wave. We aim to harness the concentrated burst of mechanical energy produced by these bubble collapses in three main ways. So utilizing ultrasound first to clear passages through the outer layer of dead skin cells and allow vitamin molecules to pass through. So they want to use the sound to open up little holes in your skin to allow the thing to go down into your body. Second to act as a pump that drives the drug molecules into the passages. 
last to open up the membranes surrounding the cells themselves since some types of vitamins must get into the cell function. Now, just keep going. I'll kind of summarize everything at the end here. So tests reported 700 times fewer vitamin molecules were delivered by the cavitation uh, approach compared to conventional injection. The cavitation approach uh, produced a higher immune response. The researchers theorized this could be due to the immune-rich skin the ultrasonic delivery targets in contrast to the muscles that receive the other thing. The result is a more efficient vitamin that could help reduce costs and increase the, I can't say that word, with little risk of side effects. So basically, this thing, while it seems to be, um, it's it seems to be injecting fewer of the, the vitamin things, it actually seems to be more uh, effective, ultimately. So this guy who came up with this is part of a larger team. Um, within uh, Oxford's Biomedical Ult Ultrasonics Biotherapy and Biopharmaceutical Laboratory, or Bubble, uh, the cavitation approach may be particularly conducing to DNA vitamins that are currently uh, difficult to deliver, with cavitation able to help crack open the membranes blocking therapeutic access to the cell nucleus. Uh, the other advantage of D uh, DNA vitamins like a focused immune response, low infection risk, and shelf stability can be better utilized. So ultimately, what this does is through sound waves, through sound frequency, ultrasound, they're able to have something on your skin and this thing will open up, the sound will open up your skin and the cells within your body for that to go in and absorb. That's what they're doing. So by utilizing sound, they can now get that into your body without even a needle. That's what they're working on. And again, disclaimer, Zach speculation, I think they already got it. I believe that they've already got this type of thing. We understand they've got so much when it comes to sound weaponry already. Uh, they've got all, all types of stuff when it comes to sound weapons and whatnot. And this would just be so simple for them to do. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical. 